I have been rummaging through my landscape shots for a YouTube production, and going back many years, I was surprised and yes, delighted to discover many excellent photographs taken with the classic Olympus E1 camera back in 2003. Although not appreciated at the time, the image quality of the E1, even at 5 million pixels, was amazingly good and suitable for magazine front cover reproduction because it used lenses designed for digital photography, not film. It also solved the problem of dust accidentally contaminating the delicate sensor because it was a digital camera designed from a blank sheet of paper and not adapted from a film camera in order to be first in the market. However, by presenting my images in chronological order, I am going to start with the E20. Now that was a forerunner of the E1. It had a fixed lens and a smaller 5 million pixel sensor, and able to produce decent pictures. Already I was saving to roar. It is of course the weather that really makes this picture. In the distance is the Pap of Glencoe. The pass is to the right, but this viewpoint can easily be accessed along a footpath from a hotel near Balahulish Bridge. A panoramic view needs the right day, and not just the right camera. You could own the best camera in the world, hooray! But if the weather isn't playing ball, you won't get the picture. Inclement weather has its place, but this is not the best view for cloud and rain. It needs clarity for the castle and what is beyond. Post-production might improve it, but such techniques and their use might depend on output. And not everyone, like over-processed or overcooked images that only work when the viewer is unaware of any trickery. Even I have to be careful, and sometimes, yes, I get criticised for my blue skies, but that is for my specialist market. This shot of Freshwater Bay is a photographic image that even the eye has difficulty in seeing. Today we call it HDR, High Dynamic Range, the contrast so great that it was difficult to view without shading my eyes from the sun. It was taken before the days of HDR, but it could still be taken with a good understanding of traditional photography and today's post-production techniques. Surprisingly, E. SP metering has avoided overexposure of highlights, but I stopped down to f22 to avoid flare, which might have helped, and worse in my opinion than diffraction. Much work was done in Adobe Lightroom to bring everything back together. Here the pull, the attraction, is the difference in light between Tarnhouse basking in sunlight, and the distant mountains now in dark shadow. Whereas the camera could not expose accurately for the previous shot, here that same weakness is its strength. Because the camera has metered from the foreground, the background mountains now become underexposed, heightening the effect, dare I say, artificially, which would not be seen when taking the shot. This is a skill known as having a photographic eye, understanding the difference through experience as to what the eye can see and the camera record. Note Incidentally, the placing of the tree across the lake to break up the water. If there was a reflection, I wouldn't have done that. Same technique as the last shot, 
a sunlit tree against an underexposed background, making it stand out. The skill, apart from getting the exposure right, is weather watching, and in many aspects of landscape photography, that is more important than technique. The foreground being on a diagonal helps, and although I cannot move heaven and earth, the gap in the mountains is in the right place, with the horizons left and right going up to the corners of the uncropped photograph and bottom left too, keeping the eye within the picture, not allowing it to wander out. Today I usually spot meter sunsets to avoid washed out colours, but ESP has actually done quite a good job, possibly because the important highlight is in the middle. The waters are disturbed in the lake, and it would have been good to have a reflection of Snowden. Instead, I found a sheltered corner that reflected the clouds, held by stones on the right, keeping the eye in the picture. It was a happy meeting of photographer and the right sort of weather, but I do find forecasting good sunsets rather difficult. This shot desperately needs a strong foreground, a bonus for any landscape image adding depth. The field patterns need something else, and the rocks provide that necessary feature with snow-capped hills adding that feeling of distance. Aperture priority at f11 and the advantage of four-thirds technology maintaining a good depth of field, even on autofocus. Mention the Derbyshire River Dove and we think, yes, of Dovedale. But further up the valley beyond Hartington are two isolated hills. This is walking country of the highest grade and a good deal quieter than Dovedale. The composition of the image is quite simple, going for a factual record enhanced by light and positioning myself so that the track approaches the hill on a diagonal. I am not a fan of extreme wide-angle lenses for landscapes, but occasionally the composition lends itself to the big approach. Four-thirds technology again provides more depth of field than larger formats at any aperture or lens setting, here increased further at extreme wide angle, ensuring that everything, yes everything, is bitingly sharp. It is a fascinating lens, but more effective inside churches and, of course, in confined spaces, and not for general use in landscape photography. You can probably see the attraction of this photograph, but would you now spot it on location? Seeing a composition on location is more difficult than mastering a camera. On the other hand, some people see a picture but are thwarted by the technology. I have been born with the spontaneous gift of seeing a photograph but can only master a camera up to a certain point, after which I am saved by traditional techniques. If you haven't spotted it, the picture is held in place by parallel lines across the image and a boat in the right place. I would probably crop half of the cloud away, and if I thought of it beforehand, include instead a bit more foreground. It probably was more interesting than that sky. Half of this picture is water. A reflection would have transformed the shot, but in its absence I have broken up the water with foreground interest, adding depth. Again, F11 and Four thirds technology has increased depth of field sufficiently and increased further by having the lens at extreme wide angle. If you don't know why, 
time to learn real photography from a book about traditional photography. It will answer the often asked question, what is the difference between a snap and a photograph? And you will need more than a postcard for the answer. But let's have a snap to finish. I was with a group and our bus screeched to halt when we saw this. No time to faff about with photographic niceties. Take it quick before you hold up the traffic. But notice how my intuitive approach to composition has helped me to get at least halfway towards a decent photograph. Even the reflection is in the right place, but moving that rock required a bit more time and effort. Reading, or should I say listening, in between the lines you might gather that I try to avoid photographic clichés in my work, even though at times I am wide open to that problem. Whilst my own style, because of its output, is often chocolate box, I like to show images taken throughout the day and not just at each end. This approach might be appreciated at your local camera club, but picture researchers working for publishers want to see portfolios taken in all weathers and daylight hours, and not just in popular places like national parks. After all, they are not waiting for a photograph of the lakes, no matter how good, as they are easy to acquire. Recently, I have done well in getting my Bedfordshire photographs reproduced, because now I am competing in a less saturated market, and unless you live there, and I don't, I bet you have never given it a moment's consideration, and you might be surprised if you pay the county a visit. My Herefordshire and Cheshire images are also starting to move, and a client is asking about Hertfordshire, making a future trip worthwhile. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you this, but diversity is important, and I suspect that my current selection has fallen well short of that. But blame it on the camera, not me.